the 2018 Subaru Crosstrek. Built in a zero landfill plant, so you can roam the earth with a lighter footprint. Subaru, proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. Sixty acres, that's a lot of land. It's about the same size as 40 football fields. And imagine how many plants you could grow in a garden of that size. And if you're lucky, it might look like this farm, where they're packing in 600 varieties of edible food crops. Yet in spite of that amazing production with everything from artichokes to zucchini, it's not about the lettuce or tomatoes or onions or garlic or peppers or watermelon or squash. Nope, not this farm. In fact, every plant that you see growing here on these 60 acres, it's all about the seeds. Seeds that one man believes may be the key to rebuilding an entire food system. Modern life has disconnected us pretty severely from um, things that as humans we've evolved with for many thousands of years. And if you look around at a lot of the problems and challenges that we face, um, they're not all attributable to that, but um, we have lost a lot of our roots in a pretty deep, big way. And so for me personally, there was a big interest in thinking about where do my clothes come from? Where does my food come from? Where does my house come from? Um, where does my electricity come from? And you know, this is when I was a teenager and was asking those kind of questions and thinking about what my values were and how I wanted to live my life. Tom Stearns grew up gardening, but even at a young age, what really piqued his interest was not just knowing that his food came from a plant in the ground. He wanted to know where that plant had come from too. I started saving seeds when I was 18 because I was interested in uh, connecting to the source of my sustenance in as direct a way as possible. Growing food wasn't enough. I was curious about the growing seeds and saving seeds part of it. When I was first saving seeds, I saved more than I needed. And I realized that these were some varieties that weren't actually available in any seed catalog. They'd been given to me by some family friends and things like that. And so I thought, oh, this could be something that I could share with other people. And the entrepreneur in me, I'd always had that streak in me and started lots of things all through high school. So that, that um, entrepreneurial streak kicked in and I packaged up these seeds in little coin envelopes and learned about doing germination tests so that I knew that they were good and made a little one-page flyer, really, of a seed catalog. And it was it's so darn earnest and uh, sent it out to everybody that I knew and sold $2,000 worth of seed that first year. It was from those humble beginnings, 28 varieties planted in his own backyard, that one of the leading seed companies in the United States was born. Year two, which was 1997, I had 50 varieties and sold $8,000 worth of seed that year. The year after that, it went to $18,000 and then $36,000. So that was by year four. And this was when it was just me, my pickup truck, and my dog, right? Probably by year four, so let's say this was 2000, um, is when I faced a decision point, which is, okay, am I gonna keep this thing a small little hobby or am I going to say yes to what is clearly being asked 
which is that more people wanted to buy seed. So that year, it went from $36,000 to $86,000. And that's when I was like, okay, I've got the tail of something big here. And it went, took off. I mean, it was 86,000 that year, and then it went to 150,000, then 250,000, then 450,000. And so, you know, by year seven or eight, we were at half a million dollars, and it, we had just barely gotten out of hobby stage at that point. As with any new business, one of the first things to deal with was giving the company a name. And Tom dug around in the history of his company's home state of Vermont for inspiration. High mowing seeds, yeah, the name is something that um, goes back really far. When people first came here from Europe, they started farming um, in northern New England more on the hilltops because the river valleys were small and narrow and subject to flooding. So you had this hilltop agriculture. A lot of the tops of the hills, like here, are flat or flattish. So these hilltops that they were farming on with their livestock, they called mowings uh, because of the activity of mowing, but it was a noun. So it'd be the back mowing, Tom's mowing, the high mowing. And so look at this farm. This is a typical high mowing. And it's a unique old agricultural term that really only existed in northern New England. And to me, when I was naming the company, uh, place matters. Place matters to me a lot. And so anchoring the, the business in a place with a name that stretches back to the roots is uh, important. Roots, place, history. Things that are important to Vermonters. Just a few miles away, overlooking the mountain village of Stowe, one of High Mowing's neighbors shares a commitment to those same values. The Trapp Family Lodge is a four-season resort named for the Von Trapp family singers. Yes, those Von Trapps, from the sound of music. Besides gorgeous views and a ton of outdoor activity offerings, the lodge puts a big focus on its eco-friendly amenities. Chefs work alongside staff gardeners to develop farm-to-table menus at the resort. There's extensive composting in the organic gardens. Animals raised on property are used in the restaurants. A brewery uses the site's own spring water for making beer and then feeds the cattle with the spent grain. There's even an energy producing solar array on top of the lodge's Austrian beer hall. It's the kind of place that's uniquely tied to the land and could perhaps exist nowhere else but the Green Mountain State. Set in this incredibly ecologically minded part of the country, high mowing organic seeds had struck a chord with a lot of locals who were now customers and with a growing number beyond New England. There were plenty of sources for home gardeners and commercial growers to buy seeds, but Tom Stearns was growing his seed in a way that immediately made his fledgling seed company quite unique in the industry. There was not any other organic seed out there anywhere. And so that was something people were really, really responding to. It wasn't just the fact that it was organic seed, but that most seed companies don't actually grow any of their own seed. I was growing all of it, 100%. And so when people were buying seed from me, they knew that. And it's kind of like why people go to farmer's markets sometime. It's the quality, it's the freshness, and it's to see that farmer on the other side of the table, to know where the, where the food is coming from, to be able to trust it, to ask questions. And I think because of my original impulse of wanting to go back to my own roots and to go back to the source of sustenance as much as I could, that's the same thing that my customers were feeling. They wanted to know where their seed came from. Not just that the varieties were organic and the seed was organic, but where did the seed come from? It's something a lot of gardeners never stop to consider. You can take a tomato from the time you plant it in the ground all the way through to harvest and never use a single chemical and call it organic. I sure do. But what about the seed that started that plant or the seedling? How was it grown in the farm or the field or the greenhouse? What if it had chemicals on it? Is that tomato still considered organic? And is it as organic as it can possibly be? Well, Tom says there's absolutely a difference. When you're growing food, conventionally, 
um, there are rules about all the different chemicals that you can use and, and not use. When you're growing seeds conventionally, there's also rules, but there are a lot more chemicals that are allowed. So seed crops get sprayed with a lot of things because it's not a food crop, so it's not going to translate into that risk for people. But of course, it still poisons in the environment. So when you grow seeds organically, you don't have those poisons, and it's a major reduction of them compared to the conventional comparison. Organic farmers right now, vegetable farmers, 95% of the acreage uh, that they're farming is planted with conventional seeds, not organic seeds. The industry, the organic seed industry, is in its infancy still. So there's not always enough available, and there's not the right varieties available in every case, and this is one of our main focus areas, is bringing new varieties to farmers so they can have them instead of using the conventional seed we have found that there is a pretty major difference with seeds produced organically when they're used on organic farms. If you're producing a seed organically for organic farms, it's going to be better adapted for those conditions. So uh, when you're planting a certain crop, you can do it when the weather and the soil conditions are favorable for that crop so that you don't need to come in with some rescue chemical to help solve an issue that you shouldn't have in the first place if you are paying attention to those things. If you're using a conventional seed on an organic farm, it's like the variety is not bred for the conditions that you're growing it in. And so you're not going to have the maximum benefit and potential unlocked of, of what you could have. So using organically bred varieties instead of conventionally bred varieties is very much like having a much sharper tool instead of a dull tool when you're using it. And so if you're finding varieties that really fit, that have the flavor you're looking for, this is what we're selecting and choosing our varieties. High flavor, high disease and, and insect resistance, high yield, and those are things I think that matter for home gardeners quite a lot. It mattered to Maggie Higby, co-managing a five-acre organic farm on Long Island. It was important to me to buy seed uh, and vote with my dollar when I did. Um, so I had to do a little bit of research and find a company that I felt like would spend the money that I was giving them in a responsible way that I supported. And I had always bought a little bit of my seed from high mowing, but it was the only company that I bought from that was 100% organic, and that made a huge difference to me personally. In fact, Maggie believed so much in what high mowing stood for that she left the farm to join the team. I work in the marketing department here, which means that uh, it's kind of my responsibility to communicate what high mowing does to our customers and why we're special. At high mowing, we are certified organic, which means we don't use any synthetic pesticides or chemicals. Um, that is extremely important for creating a really robust ecosystem that's friendly to the waters that we use on the agricultural land, um, the air, all of the animals and microbial life that's in the soil. Um, it's really important for the impact that it has on the environment. Um, when you are buying seed that is not produced organically, a lot of that seed is sprayed with synthetic chemicals and pesticides because it needs to be able to survive a longer time in the field. Seeds take a long time to mature, longer than it would for a vegetable that you harvest to eat. Um, and because of that, they are more susceptible to disease and pest pressure. Um, so usually they're staying in the ground for three to four weeks longer than they would if you were harvesting them to eat, which means they need a lot more mitigation to stay safe from those diseases and pests. And when they're grown conventionally, that means spray. Growing seeds is definitely different than growing vegetables for food. So if you think about lettuce or radishes, those are some of the quickest things in your garden. Radish might take a month, lettuce might take two months. For seed, radishes take seven months, seven times longer than a food plant. Radish plants get to be this tall and this big around. So it is a very different thing for the timing, for the weed control, for fertility, water, anything like that. 
And remember, this 60-acre farm in Vermont is putting out seeds to be sold all across the country in very different environments. So the seeds have to grow not just here, but wherever the customer is ordering from. We don't want to find the variety of tomato that just works for Georgia or just works for Southern California. We want to find one that works in both places. Plus, if you've lived in Georgia or you've lived in California, you lived anywhere for five years or more, the weather is nuts. It's changing all the time. So a variety that might be selected and bred for Georgia, which Georgia? The Georgia of today, the Georgia of 20 years ago, or the Georgia of 20 years ahead of now? So if we can find varieties and breed varieties that have that long-term robustness and resilience like a workhorse, not a fancy prima donna racehorse, but something that is sturdy and rugged and can withstand different conditions, whatever climate change is throwing at it, then we've got a winner. That means lots of experimental planting. Taylor Maida is the trials manager, testing different varieties of the same crop, evaluating which seeds perform best in various conditions, choosing which new seed varieties will be added to the high mowing catalog, and making sure the rest of the high mowing staff really knows what they're growing and selling. Our sales staff, uh, has, they come out on a weekly sales walk. Um, and so they'll come out and look at what's ready or new ads that we've decided to add, then they'll, they become familiar with them firsthand. Everyone at High Mowing does a few different jobs, so everyone is knowledgeable about the product. Paul Betts' title is sales manager, but he's also intimately involved with the trial gardens and growing the plants that produce the seeds he sells. You're wearing a lot of hats basically here at High Mowing. Very true. But one of the things that you're definitely involved in a lot is in collaborating on the trial side and coming up with those things to determine what is that next great variety. Yep. Just things like that. Yeah, and that's an offshoot of our product development process. And so annually we'll come through and kind of look at the catalog, look at the, look at the assortment and find what we call kind of the soft spots where we want another variety to fit this a slot that we don't have or if there's a variety that's underperforming mm -hmm. and we'll use those guidelines to come up with the trials plan and Taylor who's our trials manager will then go and work with vendors who may have a variety that we haven't seen yet or have one that's coming down the road or work with other independent breeders and kind of assemble what's going to be in the trials and then we plant it out and Taylor and I do the evaluations as the season unfolds. So as a grower mm -hmm. to high mowing seeds, there's a, there's a lot of quality control steps through the entire process, right? Right. Starting with the right stock seed, okay. which is the seeds that you're growing the plants to produce the seed crop. And then ultimately there's, a, there's always going to be a little bit of a genetic drift within mm -hmm. the seed. And so part of the job of the grower is to go through and rogue out the plants that look a little bit different. Um, and it's called roguing. Um, and you remove those seeds, remove those plants, excuse me, from the system. Is genetic drift a uh, seed that got into that batch from a prior harvest? What is not, that? It, well, if, you, uh, if you're combining lots of different genetics into a plant, there's all kinds of like little recessive traits within any given seed. And sometimes they come up in a way that is, represents an off type or a sport is another name for them. And so your job as the seeds person is to remove those and keep them, keep the seed that you're producing being true to type. In the field, yeah. you're gonna be looking for how the plants hold up to disease. Um, you're gonna to wanna to remove any infected plants that are going down from disease. You're gonna to want to remove any plants that are showing stress that's causing them to prematurely bolt mm -hmm. um, because you don't want that trait to be carried on into the, into the genetics that you're selecting for. Huh. Um, and then post-harvest, we will be looking at germination and vigor, um, and that happens in the lab at the warehouse. Excellent. Yeah. So I know bolting on these, on these leaf crops and cool season crops, a lot of people want to know how do they slow down the bolting process. And one of the ways, based on what you've just said, is to select varieties that are slower to bolt. Is that a fair statement? Yep, and can handle uh, higher stress. Mm. If you think about what the plant's doing when it's bolting, it's trying, the whole point of a plant is to grow and make seeds. Yes. And so 
part of the bolting process is the plant feels threatened. And so that threat translates into the, the lift. Life is getting a little tough, and so now it's time to make some seeds. <laughs> and so if you can do anything to reduce the stress that that plant is under, right. that will prolong how, how long it will grow before it starts to bolt. Oh, right. And I always tell people to think like a plant. And your job as a grower or a gardener is to create like the easiest environment for the plant to grow in. What a great analogy. Yeah. But as simple as it seems, creating an easy environment for things to grow in has proven to be exceptionally difficult for the human race. And Tom Stearns hopes the little company that started as a backyard hobby can help turn the tide. We can't really blame humanity too much for screwing up as much as we've had because we, um, we didn't really know a whole lot for a whole bunch of years. Like, we didn't mess this planet up a thousand years ago, really, because we weren't big enough to do it. But we have for the last few hundred years because we didn't really understand ecology and how that works. Well, we don't have that excuse anymore. Now there's a whole bunch of billions of us and we understand ecology and science. We don't have any excuse for doing the damage that we're doing now. So if we want this habitable planet to be something that's thriving with humans on it long, long, long term, we need to re-figure out a whole bunch of things. Energy and agriculture are the two biggest ones, in my mind. If you look at causes of conflicts around the world, even for the last 500 years, they've been around food and energy. Maybe there's been salt, or maybe it's been cod, or maybe it's been oil, or whatever it is. Um, control of land, how we farm, how we eat, most of the damage done to this planet is done in the name of this food system that we have not designed we have stumbled into it while fairly drunk on fossil fuels. It's like not our best work, right? We will wake up eventually with the hangover and say, okay, we gotta clean up this mess. So this new food system that we need to create needs to think deeply about how we take care of the soil, the water, the air, what tools we use, what fuel we use, what types of seeds we use, what the nutrition is that goes into the soil and then into the food and then into people. And so this new food system that I feel driven to be a part of changing through these seeds is something that I think has a, a, a global uh, effect and a global requirement. If we don't try, we're losing our capacity to grow food here. We're destroying soil in the process of doing it. So uh, there are a whole lot of aspects of the new food system, and it's not all just about organic agriculture, um, and it's not all just about farming scale. It could be growing food indoors. It could be growing food on your rooftops. It could be growing food in small ways all over the place. But it is the single biggest way that we engage with this earth, and we are doing it wrong. There's no arguments about that among people. We just need the courage to figure out the new ways of doing it. You know, as gardeners, we tend to get so caught up in the growing process with our eye towards the finish line, coaxing those plants along to maybe the biggest flower blooms or the best tasting tomato or maybe a higher yield than last year. But maybe we should turn our attention to the front end because it all starts with the seeds. And as we learned today, not all seeds are created equal. So maybe that's where we start the questions, like where did the seed come from and who's growing it and how is it treated and how were the plants treated before the seeds were even harvested? Tom Stearns may have started with a few seeds in his backyard, but he's grown a lot more than a thriving business. And he's doing a big part for growing a greener world. If you'd like to learn more about high mowing organic seeds, we have that information on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, that's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.